Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at theological liberalism in our continuing study of church history. In our timeline, we came up to the point of Darwin's origin of the species in the mid-1800s. Uh, Darwin, after coming off of his five-year voyage aboard the HMS Beagle, he was the ship's naturalist. Uh, Darwin, by the way, had started off as a ministerial student. Uh, he had become disillusioned and then taken on this voyage. Uh, and he comes back and he publishes his book, The Origin of the Species. That's the, the shorter title, and we'll just go with that one right now. And in this, he says, the mystery of the beginning of all things is insoluble by us, and I for one must be content to remain an agnostic. So he's not really taking an atheistic position. He's just saying, I don't know uh, if God is there, but he's postulating a theory of how life came about apart from God. God has really no, no part in the picture, although Darwin admits, I don't know how it all started. Sir Julian Huxley takes this a step further by saying man is not a finished product and capable of further progress. Rather, he has a long history behind him, and it is a history not of a fall, but of an ascent. So Huxley uh, pictures man as, as rising up, as evolving, getting better and better, and who knows what uh, to that which man can ultimately attain. Walhausen, Julius Walhausen, takes the theories of Darwinism and he applies them to the scriptures. Uh, and he comes out with what's known as the documentary hypothesis, uh, loosely known as the JEPD theory. And these are named after, first of all, the J stands for Jehovah. And what had been noticed is that when you read Genesis chapter 1, it begins in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and God all throughout is called um, by the Hebrew title, the way you say God in Hebrew, you say Elohim. And so there's Elohim, but then you get to chapter 2, and suddenly there's a change, he's called Jehovah Elohim. So you begin calling him by that name Jehovah, or as you say in Hebrew, Yahweh, um, actually, most Jews don't even pronounce the name. Um, but um, you have these two titles, and they are used sort of back and forth, not usually at the same time. Um, and it was postulated, it had, had been suggested hundreds of years earlier, that maybe when Moses sat down to write uh, Genesis, he had some documents that used the name Jehovah and some that used the name Elohim. And that these various uses of various source documents used by Moses um, are reflected in the use in Genesis. Now, Walhausen isn't merely suggesting that. He's suggesting that Moses had nothing to do with it, that these source documents are, were written long after the fact. So you have uh, source document Jehovah, source document Elohim. There is Deuteronomy that just doesn't fit into that mix at all. It, it's a completely separate component. Uh, and then there are all those numbers and genealogies and things like that that you have in, in the Torah. And he said that's a, a fourth author, that's the priestly writings. And some later redactor came along and put all these together. So these original writings were collected, and then a long time later, like after the Babylonian captivity, you finally get to where these are written in the form that we have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So, you know, Moses, if he existed at all, and Wellhausen really doesn't think that he did, uh, and people like David and Solomon, that, that's all mythology. Uh, and this was, um, this is how the Bible originated. It evolved. Now, in response to that, you're going to have a number of Christians rise up, not only Christians, but Christian institutions, rise up and who say no there are certain fundamentals that we need to hold to if we are really going to be Christians. Five major fundamental Christian teachings. First of all the inerrancy of the scriptures. The scriptures are the word of God. They are uh, inerrant. They are without error. We can trust them. 
Secondly, the virgin birth and deity of Christ, that he uh, is the one who became, he is God who became flesh, uh, born of a virgin, his supernatural origins. Thirdly, the substitutionary atonement uh, that is received by grace through faith. In other words, Christ died on the cross, I trust in him uh, through faith, and I receive that gift of eternal life that he gives. Fourthly, the bodily, physical resurrection of Jesus. These things were being denied by those who followed after Wellhausen. The bodily resurrection of Jesus, and, and then the fifth one, the second, uh, physical second coming of Jesus, that he's going to come one day and history will come to a close. Uh, one of the fundamentalists, and there were a number of them, but we're only going to mention some of the more popular ones, D.L. Moody. Dwight Moody actually started off working in a, in a shoe store. Uh, he apparently was some, some uh, up-and-coming young salesman, uh, even as a teenager. And uh, he looked out the door when he had been going to a Sunday school uh, class led by a sort of a, a shy maybe introverted person by the name of Edward Kimball, who yet loved the Lord and loved his boys. And uh, Moody look, looks out the window uh, of his store one day, and he sees Kimball sort of pacing up and down the sidewalk, trying to get up the nerve to come in and talk to Moody. And, and finally he does, and he comes in, and he tells Moody about Jesus. And, and Moody come, becomes a Christian. And eventually, as he gets trained, he begins teaching Sunday school and goes on to become a traveling evangelist, uh, spreading the gospel uh, all throughout both the Americas and even England. He says, someday you will read in the papers that Moody is dead. Don't you believe a word of it? At that moment, I shall be more alive than I am now. I was born of the flesh in 1837. I was born of the spirit in 1855. And that which is born of the flesh may die, but that which is born of the spirit shall live forever. Another uh, figure that's going to have an impact on this age is going to be Cyrus Schofield. He's got a background in law and politics. He converts to Christianity in 1879, and a mere four years later, he's ordained. You know, maybe that's you know a bit soon, uh, but he publishes, uh, and he'd been influenced by Moody and by Hudson Taylor. But he publishes the Schofield Reference Bible. And it's a study Bible. It's got some nice, you know, um, cross-reference notes, and, and certainly that's a good thing. But it also um, teaches that form of theology that we talked about in the last class, dispensationalism. Uh, and it became a tool to propagate and to spread dispensationalism, a very effective tool in its day. Another uh, of the fundamentalists at this point was uh, Billy Sunday. Now, Billy Sunday was a professional baseball player when he became a Christian, and so he was already well-known. And he takes his f the fame that he already has, uh, converts to Christianity, and he becomes a traveling evangelist. In fact, it's said that uh, he'd run up onto the stage, the front platform, and he'd sort of slide into first, and everybody would clap because they all knew of him. Uh, he had these tent meetings uh, that would come to a town and bring the gospel, and people's lives would be changed. Uh, it's what they call the sawdust trail because, uh, you know, when you're setting up a uh, tent in the middle of a open field, it's, li it's likely to be muddy and wet. And so they'd, they'd get uh, bags of sawdust and just put them out, uh, and this, this would be an area where it would sort of keep things dry. The Sunday says that Kansas City, Kansas, before... The saloons were closed. They were getting ready to build an addition to the jail. Now the doors swing idly on the hinges, and there's nobody to lock in the jails, indicating the kind of social changes that had come about through the preaching of the gospel. Now, in the early 1900s, we're going to have the rise of the Pentecostal movement. And it's brought together, there are a number of movements that uh, are going to feed into this. First of all, the Methodist Holy, Holiness Movement. Remember that the Methodists, uh, John Wesley and Charles Wesley, had been part of a holy club. And uh, they had taken the view of, 
of entire sanctification that it's, it's possible for a Christian to be so good and so pure and so perfect and so faithful that eventually he comes to the point where he is entirely sanctified, he's completely holy, and he doesn't sin any longer. And John Wesley was the first to say, and I haven't gotten there yet, and, and never did claim to get there, but he felt it was possible. Um, that you would get to this point and you would have a second blessing. Remember his own conversion experience? He'd, he'd heard of Jesus and he'd been preaching for Jesus and then one day he's sitting in a church service and he feels his heart strangely, strangely warmed. And so this began to be described in terms of a second blessing. Uh, I'm not sure if you ever get over the first blessing, but um, entire sanctification and a second blessing. Now, another move at this point was the Keswick movement. It comes a bit later, based in England. And this is the idea that spiritual power is given for service, but what I need to do to get that power is, is sort of let go and let God and, and, and be a bit more passive and let him come and do the work within me. Not necessarily a bad thing, but that, that was the emphasis there. And then we've already discussed the holiness camp meetings uh, that would take place uh, in the Americas. And these three, these three a aspects are going to come together in the modern Pentecostal movement that kicks off with a preacher by the name of Charles Parkman in, on January 1901. This is the beginning of the new century, the first you know, the first month of the new century. Uh, he's holding meetings in Topeka, Kansas, and Agnes Osmond all of a sudden begins speaking, and nobody can understand her, and Parkman says, praise the Lord, she is speaking in tongues from now on. We won't need to go and learn other languages when we send missionaries around the world. They can just speak in tongues, and they'll be understood. Now, it not going to work out quite the way he thought that it would. Um, but that's that's the beginning of this modern Pentecostal movement. And so he's thinking that, that this is going to be an evangelistic outreach, that missionaries will no longer need to learn foreign languages, um, but it, it won't work out quite that way. Uh, however, Parkman goes on to uh, Los Angeles and takes part in what is known as the Azusa Street Revival. And he is working hand in hand with a Afro-American preacher, uh, William Seymour. And this begins in 1906. And they have three services a day, seven days a week for three years. And great revival comes. Um, it's amazing. Remember, this is in the early 1900s. They are transcending racial barriers. And that was a big deal in that time in history. And so I think it really was a wonderful moving of the Spirit of God. So all of these, the Holiness Movement, the Keswick Movement, the Holiness Camp Meetings, all come into what we're calling the Pentecostal Movement. And yet today we speak of a larger movement that embraces that. And we refer to the charismatic movement, which is bigger, um, more extending than that initial Pentecostal movement. And it continues to be felt even today. And of course, there's, there's a stress both on uh, the, the tongues and sign gifts that, that, were, uh, that were suggested uh, early at the beginning of the movement, but also it has impacted things like worship and uh, how we do um, our worship services and, and other areas as well. Now, we w notice I've skipped over World War One, and I said we were going to talk about wars, but uh, in World War One, we have this amazing switch where, remember, man was supposed to be getting better and better. He was supposed to be evolving, and instead we find out uh, all the all of man's advances is just leading him to further and faster ways to kill himself. Um, and it's on the, uh, sort of on the end of that, that we have uh, Harry Emerson Fosdick. He is a uh, Baptist preacher who publishes a book, The Manhood of the Master, and he's denying the deity of Christ. Now, he's a preacher. He's preaching, going to be preaching in New York City, 
and he preaches a famous sermon entitled, Shall the Fundamentalists Win? And he asks the question, he says, the question is, has anyone, has anybody a right to deny the Christian name to those who differ with him on such points, like the deity of Christ, and to shut up against them the doors of Christian fellowship? Because Christians are, were saying, he's not a Christian. You can't, you know, if you're denying who Jesus is, if you're denying that he died on the cross for our sins, how can you claim to be a Christian? And he's saying, you don't have the right to call me a non-Christian. And his question is, shall the fundamentalists really win the day? And it's up for grabs. Now, one who is opposing him is John Gresham Machen. In fact, I, I uh, used Machen's book, uh, his Greek New Testament. Uh, it was a Greek uh, grammar of Greek New Testament in when I was in college, um, and he was professor at Princeton Seminary, professor of New Testament, uh, and he leaves the seminary in 1929 because the seminary is turning liberalism. The question, the, the, it's turning liberal. The question had been, shall the fundamentalists win? And it looks like, at least from the point of view of Princeton, no, they won't. And so he leaves to begin, uh, and he leads the charge because a number of professors leave Princeton, and they go to begin Westminster Seminary, a seminary that will stand for uh, those fundamentals like inerrancy and, and the virgin birth of Christ. In fact, one of the books that Machen uh, writes is, is on the virgin birth, an entire book just on that topic. He also, uh, even though he's part of the Presbyterian Church, he... Uh, organizes an independent pre uh, Presbyterian mission board. And the reason he does this is because the mission board to which he belongs, the, the denominational mission board, has been sending out missionaries that don't even believe the gospel. That maybe come back and say, you know, it doesn't matter what a Buddhist believes as long as he believes something. Uh, and he says, I can't send missionaries. I can't support those kinds of missionaries. And so he... he starts this independent Presbyterian mission board, and because of that, he is declared to be divisive, the way you say that in theological language, a heretic, not because of doctrinal heresy, but because he's dividing the church, and he's removed from the church. And he leaves, and along with a number of others, and he starts a new denomination, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, uh, that's up in the northern part of the country, uh, in 1936. Machen says in his book uh, Christianity and Liberalism, and it's still a, a bestseller, uh, you can find it on Amazon.com, if the liberal party really obtains full control of the councils of the church, then no evangelical Christian can continue to support the church's work. And, and that's exactly where he's at. Now he says this in 1923. His words are you know, not intended to be prophetic, but they really are, uh, because that's exactly what took place. Now, just to give you some background, back during the uh, American Civil War, you'd had the Presbyterian Church actually had split into two parts. You had the Northern Presbyterian Church and then the Southern Presbyterian Church, and they were divided over that slave issue. Uh, it, and even after the Civil War ended in 1865, they had not come back together. So it was Machen, uh, he's leaving the Northern Presbyterian Church in 1933, to form the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. The Southern Presbyterian Church was slower in their movement toward liberalism, but eventually they did move in that direction, and the same problem was eventually seen in the Southern Presbyterian Church. Uh, it took an extra 40 years or so, but in 1973, there were ministers that left uh, th that Southern Presbyterian Church to form a different denomination, the Presbyterian Church in America. And there's been talk about having the OPC and the PCA sort of merge, uh, but that's all it's been. It's just been talk, and, and that hasn't taken place. But what did happen is the two mainline denominations, both of which had moved in that very liberal direction, uh, did, after this, they merged and became a single unit, and now uh, that liberalism sort of continues, uh, I think maybe even unchecked. Machen says, uh, 75 years ago, and he's saying this in 1923, 75 years ago, Western civilization, di despite inconsistencies, was still predominantly Christian. Today, and he's saying this in 1923, today it is predominantly pagan. I wonder what he would say about th the church and Christianity in the 21st century, were he to see it today. Um, in 1925, you have the Scopes Trial. 
Um, this is where a young fellow by the name of John Scopes, he's actually the ACLU had asked for volunteers, somebody to teach evolution in the state of Tennessee where the legal statute said you are not allowed to teach evolution in the public school. And so Scopes volunteered and he taught it and sure enough this was, um, you know, he was charged and, and it went to trial. And at the trial were two very famous uh, lawyers. Clarence Darrow was uh, the lawyer for the defense and the lawyer for the for the prosecution was past presidential candidate William Jennings Bryan who had served as Secretary of State and and had been in all sorts of public offices and a, a well-known face. Uh, and th this trial, even though Scopes actually lost the trial, he was he was fined a huge amount of uh, totaling five dollars um, but the, tr the trial uh, found uh, Scopes to be guilty, and yet it was also a trial of pug public opinion. And the public opinion went in vastly the opposite direction. And after this, we're s going to see not only evolution being taught in the schools, but religion not being allowed to be taught, and especially any sort of creation account being forbidden to be taught within the public schools. Uh, another familiar face uh, during the early 1900s, uh, Karl Barth. He's a he's trained in uh, uh, German theological liberalism, and he's known. I'm not sure he would like the title, but he's known as the father of neo orthodoxy. And uh, his statement is that God makes Himself known as we encounter the Scriptures. Now that sounds good until you realize where he's coming from and where he's going with it. Now the two contrasting views that we'd had up to this point is between theological liberalism versus theological orthodoxy. Theological liberalism was taking the stance that the Bible is merely a man-made book. Uh, remember Wellhausen had, had taken such a view that it just sort of came about as, as a bunch of later folk uh, wrote their ideas. Versus theological orthodoxy that says, no, the Bible is inspired and it is the inerrant word of God. Barth now comes along with a what he sees as sort of a a conciliatory middle road approach. Barth uh, takes his neo-orthodoxy and says, no, the Bible becomes the Word of God as I receive it by faith. Um, again, that sounds good, but that's in contrast to being the Bible being the inspired and inerrant Word of God. Now, let's talk a bit about orthodoxy versus neo-orthodoxy. In orthodoxy, it says the Bible is the Word of God. Neo-orthodoxy says the Bible contains the Word of God. Orthodoxy teaches a verbal plenary inspiration. That is, the words themselves and all of them. Plenary, you know, when you have a plenary session uh, in a seminar, that means everybody's there. Uh, so it's, it's all the words uh, are inspired by God. Neo-orthodoxy says that the authors and interpreted events and words of God. In other words, they got a real message from God and they did the, their best to try to understand it and they, they wrote their understanding. Sometimes they got it right, sometimes they got it wrong. Orthodoxy says truth is relative. I'm sorry, truth is absolute. Neo-orthodoxy says truth is relative. That, you know, is, truth is, is what you make of it. It's true to you, that sort of idea. Now, in 19... 32, we have Adolf Hitler coming into public power uh, as he is voted in to office in Germany. And there's a young preacher there uh, in Germany by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He's a German theologian. He had received his doctorate at the age of 21, so he's, he's a, a very smart fellow. Uh, he traveled to America, and he's in America when Hitler comes to power. And his friends say, you ought to stay here, you ought not to go back. But he says, no, I need to return. And he returns to, to Hitler's Germany because he sees that he needs to take a, a position of, of, le of spiritual leadership in his country. And he becomes involved in what is known as the Confessing Church. That is, um, instead, as Hitler gets the state church, the state Lutheran church, to back him and to say positive things about Nazism, he says, well, we can't do that. And so we're going to, we're going to be apart from the state church. We're a separate church. We're going to call this the Confessing Church. Uh, and and um, they're standing apart 
from the Nazi movement. He is accused, I don't know if he really was, but he is accused of being involved in a plot to assassinate Adolf Hitler. Uh, actually, they made a movie of this a few years back uh, called Valkyrie with um, Tom Cruise. Not sure how accurate that was. Uh, but uh, there's this plot to assassinate Hitler, and uh, it almost succeeds, but not quite. Uh, and and he's accused of having had a part in that. And um, the investigation reveals that he had indeed used funds to aid escaping Jews. And these funds are traced back to him. And so therefore he's arrested, and he is sentenced to death and just before Germany falls uh, he's been already placed in a concentration camp and he is executed he's strangled with piano wire and gives his life he says and he says this before he's been arrested to endure the cross is not tragedy it is the suffering which is the fruit of an exclusive allegiance to Jesus he says only he who believes is obedient and he who is obedient believes. He writes his book uh, um, on the cost of discipleship. And in Bonhoeffer, we see one in the modern day who pays the ultimate cost for his discipleship as he's put to death for the faith.